This introduction will tell you what we're going to cover in this course, Ecology, this semester. So, is ecology an old discipline or a new one? Although it's only in the last 50 or 60 years, universities in this country and other countries have had ecology professors, the science has been around for a very long time. In fact, it's probably the oldest science because our ancestors relied on knowing about organisms and their environment for many things. They had to know what they could eat, which of the plants in the environment tasted good or wouldn't kill them, at least, if they ate them. And where could they hide from their own predators, and once they realized they could eat other animals, how could they best catch them? So they had to know something about animal behavior. So the questions we try to answer with ecology today may be a little bit more sophisticated. How do we keep our crops safe from pests? How can we mine the Earth's natural resources? fossil fuels, and other sources of energy without destroying the earth. And also ecology can help us predict what will happen next in our environment. So ecology is defined by first by Ernst Haeckel in 1869 as the scientific study of the interactions between organisms and their environment. I think it's more complete to say it's the science by which we study how organisms, and this includes all kinds of organisms, interact in and with the natural world. So the word, e word ecology comes from the Greek root oikos, which means home, and the suffix ology, the study of. So when we study ecology, we're studying the home life of living organisms. The levels of study in ecology range from aught ecology, the study of individual organisms interacting with the environment, to population ecology, sometimes called deem ecology, and then community ecosystem and biosphere ecology. These are called sin ecology. But an individual is shown at the top, a little plant. A population is a group of individuals of the same species that live in the same place and therefore potentially interact with or mate with each other. A community is shown by the third line of clip arts here, a population of plants, a population of ants, of ladybugs, of mice, anything else that lives in that particular habitat those populations that live in the same place are a community. The ecosystem is though the community plus the non-living components of the environment, and the biosphere is a step up, the global processes. So in class, we're going to discuss in groups, come up with questions at each level of organization, and I'll try to give you a few, a couple examples here. Let's think about the Florida panther, an iconic animal of South Florida that was an endangered species. In fact, it still is, but there are more and healthier than there were 10 or 20 years ago. So at the individual level, we might say, how does the panther, how does an individual panther regulate heat in its body? You know, what is the purpose of its fur? Where does it stay at different times of the day? A population level question might be, how are all of the individuals in South Florida related? Are they all of the same family? Or are the ones north of the Tamiami Trail a different uh, genetic pool than those south of the Tamiami Trail? A community level question would be something that involved the panther and their prey, maybe. You know, how, what, is, what species make up the diet of the Florida panther? 
or possibly the predators on the panthers. How do they interact with cars and humans? And so on. So when you study ecology, they sometimes say ecologists are jacks of all trades and masters of none, although I'm sure lots of ecologists think they are masters of ecology. But the study of ecology overlaps many fields from molecular biology, more chemical and lab-oriented things, to taxonomy and systematics, figuring out which species are distinct from one another, physiology and behavior, how the different parts of the organism integrate, and evolution and genetics. So in ecology, we don't only study natural things, but because our species, Homo sapiens, has had such a big influence on the planet, ecology also includes human-made and influenced environments. Urban ecologists may look at gall wasps on trees in parking lots, and agricultural ecology is concerned with natural and artificial pest control and um, the importance of microbes and plant health, etc. So in ecology, some things are best tested in a laboratory rather than in the field, looking at limits to the growth of a single species. You might use microcosms or mesocosms. And some ecology doesn't even involve touching anything living. You can sit at a computer, this is good for people who don't like to go outside, and make major important discoveries. So this field has something for everyone. It's fun for me to be an ecologist because it's always been easy to explain to other people what I do at a very basic level. I like to study ants and plants and interactions between plants and their mutualists and um, enemies, things that eat them. So it's easy if I'm having a picnic with a friend who doesn't know much about biology, I can explain at a very basic level what I do and they understand it. But I don't want you to think all of ecology is really simple. However, you guys are all scientists and so You'll remember what the scientific method is. Ecology does this in all different ways. But the first step is observing some phenomenon that happens, and then you ask a question about it. You may make a prediction also. What will happen to a population or an ecosystem under a particular set of circumstances? And I'm going to use as an example here one of my very favorite organisms from native to a distant land to China, the giant panda. These two are shown playing in the play yard of a panda reserve. So everyone who admires pandas can make a simple observation that they eat bamboo. In fact, they may eat a few other little things, but their main diet um, item is bamboo. And the bamboo plants grow clonally, and they flower synchronously within clones every hundred years or so. And they are monocarpic um, or semiparous. They reproduce and then they die, the bamboo plants. So... When the bamboos die, when the olden days, pre-humans, the forests were more contiguous and pandas could move from one piece to another looking for more bamboo. But with increasing human populations, the remnants of forests are fewer and fewer, smaller and farther apart. So pandas run out of food in the wild. And this is bad news for pandas who need to eat to survive. So we can make some predictions about pandas that they may go extinct unless the bamboo forests are replanted or their food is augmented by imported bamboo, like you might see pandas in a zoo eating. 
These photos were given to me by a friend who worked with pandas, and she found that they do eat other things. This panda is enjoying a carrot with his friend, but they do need bamboo to have a healthy life. So with any phenomenon we observe, there are both proximate and ultimate explanations for why things are the way they are. The present distribution and abundance of a panda could be explained in terms of the physical environment it tolerates, the food it eats, and the enemies it has. This is a proximal or nearby explanation. So pandas eat only bamboo. Bamboo is in the uplands of China, and pandas occur only there. And here's a little panda taking advantage of a nearby piece of bamboo. But ultimate explanations for questions like how did the species come to have these properties, these specializations that now govern its life? Why do pandas eat only bamboo? This is the kind of thing that has to be answered in evolutionary terms. And pandas are the way they are because of the ecological experience of their ancestors. We have to look back to understand. And sometimes this is done by looking at the fossil record to help us understand the evolution of special parts of the panda's body and digestive tract that has made them the way they are today. So the scientific method is useful for testing proximate explanations where we observe something, ask a question, form a hypothesis that's testable. We do some experiment or gather data and make observations to test that hypothesis and then we either accept it or falsify it and reject it. Ultimate explanations are more difficult to test, but not impossible. But most of what we do in ecology is looking at proximate explanations. So I want to talk a little bit about the challenges of doing good experiments in the natural environment. Unlike the lab, outside conditions are quite variable. So it's very important to have controls when you do any kind of manipulation. It's also difficult to change just one variable at a time and holding everything else constant. So you have to make sure you're looking at the effect of whatever you're doing to manipulate that condition. There's a neat example of this in our book um, that Bob Marquis and Whalen did in the 90s, studying oaks in the Ozark Mountains. Their hypothesis was that birds eating insects on oak trees reduce the amount of leaf area consumed, that is, reduced herbivory. So they found a lot of oak saplings, small trees, and erected bird exclusion cages over them with a roof and netting all around the tree. If they'd only done that and had as their controls open trees, they might have had an unexpected effect of the cage shading the plant. So their experimental treatment, the net around the plant, excluded the birds from the foliage. One of their control was the trees without cages, but then they also had a bird-excluding cage that they had openings in to let birds in to control for any negative effects of shading. Now, I'm particularly fond of butterflies, so I want to make sure you know the basics of the butterfly life history for this next example. Starting with an egg that was laid on a host plant by a pair, mother, the egg hatches and the little caterpillars, whose job it is, is to eat and grow, go through five different stages or instars. When they're ready to, when they're fully fed, they undergo metamorphosis, forming a chrysalis, we call that a pupa. They sit around for a few weeks in that stage and transform from a crawling insect to a winged flying adult. And part of my early research in Costa Rica was studying uh, trees 
and the caterpillars that ate them. And at lower elevation, a given species of butterfly would have developmental time of 20 days, that is spending 20 days as a caterpillar. At higher elevations, developmental time was 30 days, a third as much greater. So what are the factors that affect the length of time it takes from egg to adult? We might make different um, hypotheses about that. You might suggest one or the other. Well, you could get many people suggesting different things. But any hypothesis that you suggest, test, and uphold, and then is repeatedly upheld, can become an ecological theory. And theories generate controversy between different groups of ecologists. So any theory, optimal foraging theory, optimal defense theory for plants, comp competition theory, people are always thinking of new experiments and arguing about what really causes the phenomena they observe.